Madam Deputy Speaker. Professor Ko Lian Pin. Question one, please. Madam Deputy Speaker, may I have your permission to address PQs 1 to 4 and written PQs 22 and 23 on today's order paper by a combined reply? And for any supplementary questions to PQs 1 to 4 to be taken after the reply to PQ 7 has been given, as the issues raised in PQs 1 to 7 are interrelated and will be addressed jointly by me and the Senior Minister of State, Tan Kiat Hao, for national development. Please do. I thank members Professor Ko Lian Ping, Ms. He Ting Ru, Dr. Tan Wu Ming, and Mr. Christopher de Souza for their questions on how Singapore is preparing for rising temperatures. I will address them together with MS, SMS Chan in two parts. First, I will set out the broad context of how climate change and rising temperatures will affect Singapore and outline the government's approach to strengthening Singapore's heat resilience. SMS Tan will then elaborate on specific policies and measures to cool our neighbourhoods and community spaces. In recent weeks, many countries have been experiencing heat waves, including China, India, Pakistan and many European countries. Record-breaking temperatures above, above 40 degrees Celsius have resulted in deaths, heat injuries and damaged infrastructure. These heat waves are increasing in frequency and intensity worldwide as a result of climate change and portends the severe consequences we would face if we do not take significant steps today to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Singapore will not be spared the impacts of global warming. 2012 to 2021 was our warmest decade on record. The Centre for Climate Research Singapore, CCRS for short, has projected that climate change will lead to average temperatures rising by 1.4% to 4 points. Sorry, let me say that again. Average temperatures rising by 1.4 to 4.6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Days with peak temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius may appear as early as 2045. This is compounded by the urban heat island effect, or UHI effect, where built up areas are warmer due to heat trapped by buildings and heat generated by activities such as transportation and industry. To prepare for rising temperatures, the government has adopted a science-based and proactive heat mitigation and adaptation strategy, which has three points. First, we are deepening our understanding of the science behind how rising temperatures affect Singapore and our residents. Second, we are reviewing efforts to strengthen the community's resilience to heat. And third, we are designing effective heat mitigation strategies and scaling them up. Let me elaborate on the three prongs. First, understanding the signs of how heat effects, heat affects Singapore and our residents. CCRS translates global climate projections to understand the localized effects and implications for Singapore. For example, while we do not experience the extreme temperatures arising from high pressure systems that form across large continental masses in the mid-latitude region, we are affected by climate drivers such as El Nino that are likely to be exacerbated by climate change. 
These projections are being reviewed and will be updated through the third National Climate Change Study, or V3, that will be released next year. This will enable our heat mitigation action plan and other climate adaptation planning to be informed by the latest IPCC findings and by local and regional warming trends. To understand how heat affects the Singapore population, we are driving research and development to study the factors contributing to urban heat, test different heat mitigation strategies, and assess, assess the effects of heat on public health. For example, under the Cooling Singapore 2.0 project, we are working with researchers to develop a digital model to simulate Singapore's urban climate and predict the effectiveness of various heat mitigation strategies. This enables us to understand how heat affects different parts of Singapore and identify cost-effective heat mitigation strategies. Second, we leverage science to design better policies and guidelines to strengthen community resilience to climate change, especially to account for the fact that some segments of our population, such as the elderly or outdoor workers, may be more vulnerable to rising temperatures. MOH and MSE are studying how heat stress could affect our population. MOH, MOM and the Workplace Safety Health Council also work closely together to ensure that guidelines on managing heat stress at workplaces are regularly updated based on the latest scientific evidence, including the V3 study which I earlier mentioned. Third, designing effective heat mitigation strategies, of which there are two broad categories. First, measures to promote cooling in our urban environment, such as through urban planning and building guidelines, infusing more greenery and scaling up the use of cool materials on buildings. SMS Tan will elaborate on these. Second, measures to reduce the heat generated from human activities, such as from our homes, our roads and our industries. These include, for example, efforts under the Singapore Green Plan to electrify our vehicle population and to increase the energy efficiency of industrial, commercial and residential buildings. Individuals also play an important part. When we use less electricity, we not only reduce the heat emitted from our own electrical appliances, we also reduce the energy that needs to be generated by our power stations thereby reducing both heat generation and carbon emissions at the system level. Hence, we have been enhancing community resilience to climate change by encouraging businesses and individuals to adopt greater energy efficiency, such as the introduction of the mandatory energy labelling scheme to help consumers choose more energy efficient appliances. Although Singapore has so far not faced heat crisis on the same scale as other countries, it will not be possible to avoid the rise in temperatures due to global warming. We must continue to engage and co-create solutions with the community to enhance our resilience, climate change, to enhance our resilience to climate change. We will also roll out policies and measures to cool our neighbourhoods and community spaces, which SMS Tan will now elaborate on. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, may I have permission to take uh, PQs of 5 to 7 together, please? Please proceed. Let me elaborate on the specific measures we have put in place to cool the environment and address the urban heat island or UHI effect in our neighbourhoods, community spaces and industrial estates. Professor Colin Pin asked about the progress and impact of our initiatives to reduce ambient temperatures such as introduction of greenery on the top of our multi-storey car parks, the use of cool paints on HDB blocks and the planting of trees in our industrial estates. He also asked about whether we can select specific trees, species of or vegetation to provide the most optimal cooling benefits. 
Dr. Tang Wu Meng asked if studies have been conducted on ambient interior temperatures of HDB flats across different times of the day and weather conditions, and if we can consider temperature trends in designing new HDB projects. As Minister Graceful earlier highlighted, the government adopts a science-based and pro proactive approach to various aspects of climate adaptation, including the rise in temperature. BCA requires buildings to be designed to limit heat gain from the exterior, which helps to improve the thermal comfort of building occupants. BCA's Green Mark Scheme also recognises buildings that implement urban heat island mitigation measures, such as applying cool paints and providing greenery. In the design of HDB projects, HDB currently deploys various strategies to optimise thermal comfort. For example, our HDB buildings are predominantly oriented in the north-south direction to reduce heat gain. For new towns and estates, HDB conducts environmental modelling to site new flats, design building facades and refine building layouts to harness existing wind corridors and optimise wind flow. For existing towns, HDB is conducting a pilot study on cool paint, which could absorb less heat and reduce the ambient temperatures of HDB blocks. Past trials have shown a reduction of amb ambient temperatures by up to 2 degrees Celsius. The pilot is expected to, complete, to be completed in 2024. Based on the study outcomes, HDB will consider extending the use of cool paint to more estates. Under the HDB Green Town Programme, which covers all existing HDB towns, HDB is introducing greenery to the top decks of selected multi-storey car parks in the form of urban farms, community gardens and rooftop greenery, using the prefabricated extensive green or PEG uh, roof tray system based on the suitability of those car parks. These efforts also aim to reduce ambient temperature. We are also intensifying greenery in our industrial estates, which are amongst the hotter areas in Singapore. To date, nearly 90,000 trees have been planted in our industrial estates under the One Million Tree Movement with the help of our partners in the community. These trees are planted to resemble the look and feel of natural forests, to provide pedestrians with shade and respite from the heat. These efforts have helped to beautify and cool industrial estates such as the Jurong Island, Seleta Aerospace Park and the Tuas Industrial Estate to create greener and more conducive workplaces. We aim to increase the number of trees across our industrial estates from 180,000 trees today to about 260,000 trees by 2030. And studies have shown that intensified tree planting in Singapore can reduce midday temperatures in the surrounding areas by up to 0.9 degrees Celsius. We will continue planting more trees across Singapore under the One Million Tree Movement to mitigate the effects of climate change and provide Singaporeans with a more livable and more sustainable environment. We are also working with institutes of higher learnings to examine the cooling effects of various tree typologies and planting configurations. We also deploy an island-wide network of sensors to monitor the cooling effects of our tree planting effort. The data collected will support microclimatic research in Singapore and help MPARCs develop better greening strategies to cool Singapore. In summary, the government takes a broad-based holistic approach that will help all segments of the population cope with rising temperatures. Dealing with impacts of climate change requires collective ac action and community resilience. Together, we will ensure that as a nation, we can adapt, adjust and remain resilient in the face of climate change. Mr. Dr. Tan Wuming. I thank the ministers for their answers, and I've got three supplementary questions. Madam Deputy Speaker, as background, yesterday in the US Journal Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, a peer-reviewed report was published by the Cambridge Centre for the Study of Existential Risk, entitled Climate Endgame, Exploring Catastrophic Climate Change Scenarios. It proposes serious consideration of worst-case scenarios in climate crisis. My three questions to the ministers are as follows. Firstly, the minister mentioned that the temperature projections might reach 
peak daytime temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius in Singapore by the year 2040. Can I ask, is this a median scenario? Or have worse scenarios, more severe scenarios been considered? And are we getting ready for those as well? Secondly, is the government considering the possibility of low probability, high impact situations? For example, if extreme climate situations affect energy resilience and thereby the ability of households in Singapore to maintain air conditioning across the island during a heat wave. And thirdly, I'm not sure if I missed the answer, but has the minister from the National Development Ministry mentioned what is the data on the temperature of HDB dwellings across different times of the day and in particular, whether HDB flats will continue to be safely habitable amidst very high temperatures, even in the absence of air conditioning. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank uh, Member Tan Wu Ming for his questions. In fact, I think it's, uh, I'm very gratified to see that members are truly interested in climate change and its in impact on Singapore and Singaporeans. It is the greatest challenge to mankind, um, and I think that we should really devote attention and resources to address this global challenge squarely. Um, in our projection, we look at three broad scenarios. One is a business-as-usual scenario. The other is um, uh, you know, a scenario where we are taking good steps to mitigate emission. And the third is to assume a situation where uh, fossil fuels continue to be uh, harnessed for energy. Uh, this is not um, a scenario that's determined by Singapore only. This is actually adopted by IPCC, which is a collection of um, thousands of scientific uh, journals and uh, scientific research. Um, so it is, in a way, an aggregation of the global uh, thought leaders on this issue about climate change. Uh, so within these three scenarios, the peak 40 uh, degrees C forms one of the data point. Uh, but obviously, we're looking at the three scenarios uh, squarely and looking at how that will impact Singapore specifically. Uh, because we are quite different from the northern or southern hemisphere. We have the tropics, we are an island, we are not large continental masses. So we do have our own climatic patterns that require careful local study. And that, in fact, is what we will be doing over the next many years, decades or so. Indeed, I think Dr Tan is very, very wise to point out that there are low-impact sorry, low probability by high impact events. These may not be what is surfaced currently in the IPCC report, but we are constantly in discussions with scientists. We, ho we just hosted um, the World uh, research, Climate Research Programme in Singapore, having the chance to speak to many world-class um, climate scientists and having them informed our view on planning. So while our long-term planning do not have these impact events in mind, uh, but we are always constantly looking for inputs and they will always shape our planning parameters. Uh, I will leave the third question to SMS Tan. Madam Deputy Speaker, I thank the uh, member, Dr Tan Wu Ming, for his question. At the heart of it, I think he's asking whether HDB plans for the thermal comfort of residents as a priority, and I'd like to assure Dr. Tan that it's indeed so. I mentioned earlier in my uh, earlier remarks that uh, we look at the uh, environmental modelling, the wind flow, and looking how the occupants of the HDB building can be comfortable during the day even. And we don't take assumption that everybody switches off the air conditioning. And perhaps an additional uh, assurance to Dr. Tan uh, that the uh, HDB Green Town Programme in 2020 uh, looks at a 10-year plan to make HDB towns more sustainable and livable. To his question about the energy consumption uh, of HDB towns is something that we are concerned about. The program which I mentioned, the HDB Green Towns program, focuses on reducing energy consumption 
recycling rainwater and cooling down HDB towns. We aim to reduce the energy consumption in HDB towns by 15% from 2020's level by 2030. And additionally, I'd like to add on about the thermal comfort is that we look at passive strategies in the design of its buildings to optimize the thermal comfort. Like I mentioned, we don't make an assumption everybody switches off an aircon. Thus far, the wind flow is the main focus of HDB's effort in thermal comfort design. I would like to just elaborate. For new towns and estates, HDB conducts environmental modeling to site the new flats. I mentioned about north-south facing earlier, but also we look at the building design facades and refining the building layouts, the room layouts, to maximize the wind corridors and optimize wind flow. A specific example includes orienting the HDB buildings in north-south direction and requiring 45 to 60 percent green cover in new estates to ensure sufficient greenery to create a comfortable living environment for all Singaporeans. Ms. Haniso. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is in relation to some of the responses that actually uh, SMS Tanket How has just uh, provided. Um, this is a follow-up SQ on that. I understand that in relation to the HDB Green Town Programme, there will be more features that will be introduced by HDB. So in this regard, I wish to make a proposal to HDB to also consider, because many of our existing HDB flats, we incorporate full glass uh, windows that actually emit a considerable amount of heat during the late afternoon. So whether HDB can consider installing the low heat transfer double glazed windows for BTOs moving forward and also as part of the features for existing um, HDB flats as part of the HIP programs. This will really help because apart from um, new, ish, um, new, new methods that HDB is introducing, for example, cool painting, I believe that there is a dire need for us to consider to explore other suitable greener alternatives that helps cool down the HDB flats, especially since more Singaporeans are now adopting a flexible working arrangements by working from home. Thank you. I thank the, the member, Ms. Henniso, for questions. I, I, I fully agree that uh, windows are a very important part of the HDB living residential unit. And as Ella mentioned, uh, the flow of the wind and uh, actually the natural ventilation is an important strategy to keep the thermal comfort within units comfortable for the residents. Uh, we will we'll certainly look into the uh, various uh, suggestions by Ms. Henniso about the use of double glazed windows, minimizing heat transfers. These are some of the research areas and some of the areas that we are always studying with the research, research institutes as well as our partners. But perhaps just to give a little bit more assurance to Ms. Henniso and explain how we design windows. Today, windows are provided with canopies which provides sun shading and shielding from rain. The windows are so designed with larger openable panels as well as smaller top-hung windows such that the large panels are closed during heavy rain. The top-hung windows can still be opened slightly to provide natural ventilation within the flat. So windows and the how it's designed and the ventilation flows arising from that are important design considerations for HDB. Ms. hurting Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I referred to the Urban Heat Vulnerability Analysis Report uh, published in June 2020 by Cooling Singapore, which is quite a detailed um, first stage analysis, I understand, a report where um, you know, they, they actually stated that further research is being done, especially in relation to um, the regional effect of heat. Uh, this report actually states that uh, you know, um, climate change intensifies not only the urban heat uh, island effect, but also causes uh, health, social, and economic challenges. So I'd like to know, um, you know, in terms of these so this sort of slightly cross-ministerial, whole of government uh, uh, issues, you know, who, who, which agency or uh, ministry is uh, responsible for leading uh, the, the, the cross, I guess, the cross-agency um, um, uh, plans and coordination to, to address these type challenges? Um, for example, uh, this would also include question, uh, one of my SQs is would, what are the efforts to raise awareness of heat injuries in groups such as elderly and parents of young children and also, you know, uh, uh, people who work outdoors more because obviously these, uh, they're more exposed to, uh, you know, the heat uh, which only will intensify as, as the years go on. 
you know, again, I, I, I uh, refer to India's heat action plan, for example, which um, it actually maps high-risk populations and groups and increases outreach uh, and communication about the dangers of, the, you know, increased heat to these groups. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, maybe this is something that MSE would be working together with MOH. Uh, I'd like to ask whether, the, you know, it's, uh, the ministers are able to share more information about this at this stage. Um, and finally, I have one uh, question for MND in particular. Uh, I, I noticed that in the report that I quoted earlier from the Urban Heat Vulnerability and Analysis Report, um, there was a segment where you know, there was some analysis and studies done on access to cooler indoor Ms. spaces. Ms. get to your question, please. Yes, uh, I'm referring to the indoor spaces uh, during, you know, uh, I, I suppose, uh, um, particularly bad heat, uh, heat waves. I'm just wondering whether this information is going to be or has already been integrated into town planning uh, you know, whether residents have adequate access to, I guess, refuges during the day, uh, during a exceptional heat, heat waves, uh, whether or not this is something that MND is actually looking into. Thank you. Can I just remind members to please keep your questions succinct so that we can have more questions taken? All right, Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy um, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank member for the supplementary question. Uh, indeed, I think it's important for us to think uh, about challenges very holistically. And uh, that's really the genesis of the Singapore Green Plan, which is to bring multi-agencies work together uh, and to integrate our plans so that we you know, um, are clear about the trajectory and pathway that we are heading. So similarly, we come to issues such as uh, how uh, hotter temperature is going to affect human health. There are also interagency work groups to study that, whether it is MOH with MSE uh, on heat stress affecting human and population health, or MOH, MOM in the Workplace Safety and Health Council to study impact of heat on our work practices. So that will continue to be the way how the government will handle climate change. Uh, each of the ministries will have its own policy watch portfolio so that they will continue to refine and to review their policies going forward with information that's coming in from the various studies that we are doing, whether it is with V3 or whether with, with some other uh, studies such as the one that she has quoted. It's really uh, part of our research um, uh, effort to understand various impacts of climate change on Singapore better. And we will also have uh, the inter-ministerial committee that's chaired by SMTO that will bring the relevant ministries together. As and when we are informed with new inputs, we will review the relevant uh, policies and we will get the relevant ministries together to study some of these cross-ministries problems. Thank you. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the short answer to uh, the member's uh, Ms. Herting Rose question is yes. Uh, the mitigating urban heat island effect, uh, both in our residential areas, community spaces, industrial areas, is something that uh, MND family is looking at very carefully and part of our design considerations. And so add on to a point that I think Ms. Her mentioned the uh, uh, Cooling Singapore project, the research. Just to share with Ms. Her that's not just about uh, the covered spaces, but we're still looking at the outdoor thermal comfort, the outdoor uh, uh, shading uh, for our Singaporeans as they go about uh, different activities outdoors. So, for example, MPARCS is collaborating with research from the NRF-funded project Cooling Singapore 2.0 to study the impact of greenery or urban heat mitigation, specifically on tree shapes and pl planting configurations and size of green spaces. And I'm actually very heartened that the recent modeling study of trees in HDB residential precincts show preliminary that trees with large canopies, such as umbrella and oblong-shaped trees, are more effective in improving outdoor thermal comfort. In addition, increasing the tree planting densities, which we are doing under our One Million Tree Movement, will lead to further improvements in outdoor thermal comfort. And studies by other researchers have also shown that our structured multi-tier planting, managed trees over shrubs, multi-layers of canopy, can reduce midday temperatures by up to 0.9 degrees Celsius. So, holistically, we are not just looking at the design of indoor spaces, community spaces, facades of buildings, windows, ventilation, wind flow, but also looking at using greenery, nature-based solutions to provide outdoor and indoor cooling. Thank you.